I'm John Buchanan, and in this video, we're going to just take a moment to understand signal routing within Logic. Now, once upon a time, if we wanted to work in recording studios, the centerpiece of any studio would be a mixing desk. And mixing desks would receive inputs from anything you wanted to plug in. So if you wanted to connect a microphone so that you can make a recording either to a computer system or to a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, you'd plug microphones in through preamps into channels on the desk. And every sound that you needed to plug in, you'd plug in to a sequential channel on the mixing desk. And you'd actually have to make that physical connection yourself using the appropriate cable for the device that you were plugging in. Now within Logic, and every other workstation for that matter, all of that connectivity is handled digitally these days. So we don't actually have to make a physical connection between each of the tracks of a Logic project and, for example, the stereo output. It's done for us. But if we can understand how signal routing works, then actually we can use some of Logic's capability to our advantage beyond simply just asking Logic to do all of that routing for us. This is useful if we want to add auxiliary effects. It's useful if we want to build templates for projects where we want to assign groups of sounds to auxiliaries of their own. And it's also really helpful in understanding exactly how Logic's track stacks work. So what we're gonna do within this video is just to understand how signal routing works. So let's take a really basic example. Okay, so let's imagine for a second that we've got a setup like we have within Logic's Arrange page, where we've got our first track up here at the top, and what I'm going to do is to call that track 1. What I've then got over on the right-hand side is an output track, and what I'm going to do, just we'll change colour so we can see the output, and I'm going to just sort of make this big box over here, and this is going to be our output. Now then, most of the time, what we want to do and whenever we set up a new track within Logic, is that effectively what happens is our track is connected to the output track. So in other words, one track simply gets plugged into the output, and there it is. And we can see that within Logic here. I've set up one audio track, and within the mixer I can see that what's happening is this sound is being routed to the stereo output, so therefore any sounds that I put on here will automatically be patched through to the output, and that connection is made for me without me having to plug any cables in. And the same thing would be true if I set up track number two. It again would be automatically connected to the stereo output track. So far, so straightforward. But what if, for example, what I decided to do with track two was to use what we call insert effects. So if I've got track two, what I then might do would be to say, okay, well, on the way to the output, what I'm going to do is to create an insert effect. And let's call this reverb. Now then, what that means is the track is then passing through an insert effect where it's then having reverb added to it. Now, if I was to do that, let's set up track two. I'm going to create audio track two just so I'm mirroring exactly what I'm drawing. And let's suppose for a moment that what I want to do is to put a reverb on this particular track. Now, what I have a chance to do is to split the signal here at this point, interrupt it in other words, that's why we refer to these effects as insert effects. So effectively what's happening is that rather than the sound simply passing from track two all the way through to the output, instead it passes through an insert effect, which we're calling reverb. And what I have a chance to do at this point is to split the signal. I can control the level of the dry portion of the sound, the bit that's going all the way to the stereo output without being interrupted, and the wet part, which is just the reverb. So if I wanted to interrupt the sound and only hear a wet signal, I've got a volume control for that portion of the sound. If I wanted to insert this reverb but not hear it at all, I could do this. I could turn the dry signal up to 100%, turn the wet signal off altogether, and the sound would effectively be plugged into the output and the effect would be the same as there being no reverb at all. And of course, because I've got these separate controls, I'm in a position to split that signal and control their portion separately. And as a result of that, what happens after the reverb is the sound goes on to the output. With track three, I might decide that what I wanted to do was to create lots of insert effects, one after another. So what I might have would be one insert, followed by another, followed by another. And each time I add this, again, what I'm effectively doing is splitting the signal before the sound then reaches the output. And these effects might be anything. They might be tape delay. They might be compression. Or perhaps they might be flanging. 
So I've got all of these separate options and each time I patch in a new effect, one flows into the other. So far, so straightforward. Still effectively got one sound making its way to the output and either it gets there directly or it's interrupted with each new insert that I add. So we've still got a direct connection between each track and the output channel. Now then, let's suppose what I want to do with track four is something slightly different. What I want to do here is absolutely to have the same direct connection all the way through to the output. But what I also want to do is to have this channel split sideways to go into a different type of effect, which I'm going to refer to as an auxiliary. Now, what happens when I start working with auxiliaries is different to if I'm working with insert effects. What auxiliaries allow me to do, as the diagram shows, is to split the signal out to a new track where I can add effects separately. Let's just see how that works. So if I decided that I was going to add yet another new track, in fact, I think it's track four that I'm gonna do this to. So here's track four. What I'm going to do here is to set up what we can refer to as an auxiliary bus. And the moment I do that, this new track, this auxiliary track appears here. And what this allows me to do is to send signal from this first track, which is going on to the stereo output, sort of sideways out to this new track here, where again, I can do something to this sound. So I might decide that what I want to do here is like I did on this uh, track two, to add a reverb. But the advantage of me having created this auxiliary track is that it's available to every other track within my project. So in other words, I could decide that I wanted to send tracks three and one to this auxiliary track as well, and all of them can benefit from the reverb that I've put on this auxiliary track. And in real terms, what that would mean from a patching point of view is that track one would also come down from here into the auxiliary track, and so would track three, which is coming from here. And it would do so directly. So all of these sounds are now rooting into this auxiliary track before that auxiliary track makes its way to the output. Now, auxiliaries are really useful track types within Logic. We think about them first and foremost being a place where we can add an effect which is available to different tracks within our project. And we've seen that I can assign multiple tracks into one auxiliary. But what they can also do is be a place where lots of sounds are rooted automatically. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I can, if I want to, I'm going to remove all of these effects for a moment. I'm going to just go back to having no insert effects and no auxiliaries. I'll select both of these tracks and just remove this auxiliary send and we'll take out our effect channel as well. And in fact, I'm going to just remove auxiliary one altogether. So what we've now got are four separate tracks and at the moment they're all still being routed directly to the stereo output. Now, if I want to, I can decide to select all four of these tracks and I could manually override their output assignment and I could send them to bus one instead. Now, what this again is gonna do is to create an auxiliary, an auxiliary track for me. But what I've chosen to do now is to interrupt the signal flow of these four sounds. It's no longer going directly to the stereo output. Instead, all four are being sent to this auxiliary bus before the bus is then sent to the output. In other words, I've chosen to add a place where all of these sounds go before they're sent to the output. Well, why might I want to do that? What would be the advantage of that? Well, let's suppose that what all of these tracks were, were drum tracks. Let's suppose that track one was a, um, a kick track. Maybe I've recorded a multi-track drum session and I've recorded my kick microphone onto track one. And let's suppose the snare drum is on track two. And let's suppose the overhead left channel is track three and track four is the overhead right channel. In which case, this would be panned left and this would be panned right. The advantage of me routing all of these four tracks into an auxiliary is that at this point, together as a bus, I could create an EQ treatment for my overall drum kit. I could decide that I wanted to bring all of the tracks together and compress them. And because the signal is being sent to this bus before it's being sent to the output, any changes I make to the EQ or the compressor will affect all of the individual drum tracks. Now this is where things start getting interesting because I've still got access to my insert effects for all of those tracks as well. So if I wanted to compress the kick drum here, and let's choose a different 
um, algorithm for this compressor compared to the bus compressor. This would be my kick compressor. You can see it's labeled here at the top. I could then create some kick changes through this compressor before it joins all of the other drums at auxiliary bus number one, where it's EQ'd and it's compressed for a second time. So suddenly what we're doing is we're making a signal flow, which is a little bit more complicated than simply creating a whole bunch of tracks that are automatically routed through to the stereo output. Now, let's suppose in addition to my drums, I also have a multi-track string arrangement. Well, I could adopt the same approach. Let's suppose I've taken a stereo string arrangement and this is strings left and this is strings right. What I can do here, again, these tracks would be panned left and right. And what I could do with these sounds would be to say, okay, well, I don't want them to feed into the drum bus. What I want them to do instead is to feed into an auxiliary bus of their own. And this would be the string group. Now, it's very easy to get lost in logic in terms of what is what, and that's why labeling is really important. This would be my drums bus, and these would be my strings. And I can see that my routings are taking these tracks and they're sending them into this bus. Now, if you know a little bit more about the way that Logic allows you to work with auxiliaries, you'll already be thinking, well, why have I not created track stacks? Well, track stacks are a, an automatic version of what I'm creating here. They allow us to take groups of individual tracks and ask Logic to assign all of those tracks to an auxiliary bus for us. And by taking a step to understand how that process works, by going through it manually, we can understand what a track stack is. Let's suppose I also wanted to create a bunch of tracks for some synth parts that were in my project. I'll call this synth one. And what we'll do is to duplicate that and call it synth two. And we'll have one more of them as well. And this can be synth three. Well, it's true that what I can do is to select all three of these tracks, I can press control, and what I can do is to create a track stack. And it's worth looking to see what happens when we do this. What I'm gonna do is to create what's called a summing stack. And that is going to automatically do what I've been doing manually, which is it's gonna take these three tracks, synth one, synth, synth two, and synth three, it's gonna route them all through to the first available auxiliary bus. And I can see that that's been created here for me. And at the moment it's called sum three. But what I could do would be to call this synths. And exactly the same thing has happened. These sounds are now being interrupted. They're being sent into this auxiliary here before the auxiliary is being sent to the stereo output track. So effectively what we've got here is a chance to understand how routing works within Logic. We can take any track, whether it's an audio track, which is what I've been using in this demonstration so far, but the same thing is true with software instrument tracks too, and we can just leave everything running to the stereo output track if we want. But if we want to, firstly, we can insert effects onto every single track to interrupt the flow through different effects per track. Or what we can do is to select a group of tracks and automatically route those into what we refer to as an auxiliary bus, a place where all those sounds can come together before they're routed to the stereo output. And we can either do that manually ourselves or we can create a track stack. And in another episode, I'm gonna look at track stacks in depth because there are a couple of ways in which we can work with collections of sounds in this way. But it's worth taking a moment just to understand signal flow within Logic, because if you understand how signals move through Logic, you can actually get very creative with what you do at the mix stage.